Hello and welcome back. This is SC Coleman. And to start, we're going to be talking about universities, a topic I have covered extensively in various aspects. Now this is going to be talking a little bit about a detailed operations and also the overall complexity of how they work. <clears throat> Essentially, universities are a centralized base which uh, we could think of as a separate state, a uh, global universal state, uh, corporate control structure. Interestingly enough, the universities today drive most things and under the cover, they operate mostly under cover. Uh, their main mission, they would say, of course, is today is to save the planet from things like carbon emissions and all the other nonsense that they use in their doublespeak. Their actual objective is to set up the world for destruction. And in context of the Americas, the tangible operations can be found taking form, specifically with the United States and North America. Now, as far as the universities go and understanding them as the centralized operational control base, just as any military has a base of operations, well, that's what universities are. They're a base of operations. Jesuits and CIA have been known to keep offices on universities, which is documented in the CIA documents referencing Jesuit offices on university campuses in El Salvador for their civil war that they had in the 80s. And then, of course, the CIA are well known to have offices on university campuses as well, as well as other similar types of entities. Now, the universities also operate data servers, which they leverage to, essentially speaking, control the Internet. But there's, of course, more they do. They pretend to be the government. And what I mean by that is, by and large, the U.S. federal government and state governments are collapsing. Their image of control is propped up by universities. There's a lot of evidence of this in the fabrication of different documents, all coming out of the universities. And, of course, the control over information online, all being sourced by universities. The propaganda machine essentially publishes all results anyone gets on Google when they search for something. Mostly, anyway. It's very rare that when you search something, you do not get the same narrative propagated by the university structure, practically, because they control the massive data, data servers which run things like Google and on Google, when you search stuff, what you see getting published and actually all the search engines is coming from university data servers. And of course they have vast amounts of, of human resource, as they would say. They have uh, essentially worker exploitation, a massive worker base they can exploit among the students on university campuses. Now not only that, Major financial institutions who operate control over the global financial mechanism, they also have offices on university campuses, such as BlackRock and Vanguard having offices, main offices at one university drive, Princeton, New Jersey. Now, the other thing they do is they populate false identities for embedded operatives. And as you can imagine, you have CIA operatives working in different places. Well, their everything from their financial accounts, their uh, code names, their or their cover names, anywhere their cover story, even their all of their background information, right, is written from universities. Universities write their backstories. They do all of that stuff. The university mechanism is, in fact, a practical base of operations for enemy occupation. We don't have any government. What we have are universities f practically fabricating a false government. 
And when the you when you put that context into reality, it makes sense why you would have places like the University of Nebraska Kearney setting up their own judicial court system on the university itself. They in the universities understand that they are playing the part of the government and they're keeping the image of it alive because if they don't do that then they lose their enemy bases now they carry out economic and cyber warfare leveraging the university system not only that they they are behind the false representation of tangible value which is how hypothecation works, and how they leverage control over the commercial and economic system and can, in fact, wage commercial and economic war against everyone. But they also have a financial wall that they put up whenever they identify an enemy of the education system. Essentially, if you ever out yourself as an enemy of the education system in any way whatsoever, then you'll hit a financial wall. And that will look like going around and finding everything denied and making sure that you, essentially speaking, cannot generate funds, you cannot maintain funds, and you cannot go out and purchase things. That's the financial wall, and that's how they leverage it. Now, I've done many videos talking about the various aspects of how they do all of these things. But in this video, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I'm going to talk about something that can be done to them, against them, as a way of disabling or dismantling their system, in a sense. It's not exactly the idea here, but either way, it is, a, for, all, for lack of a better word, an attack. Most people think of an attack as uh, some sort of physical assault, say punching or kicking or shooting or something like that. However, there are other things that we label attacks, which in some cases aren't. And that's what we're looking at here. So everything revolves around the operation of the universities. The universities are the central core of modern control structures. Now, they trade on the identities of living people. And an example of this is with vehicle insurance. See, vehicle insurance is more accurately described as driver insurance because it's not actually the vehicle being insured, but rather the driver. The driver is insured based off of their age, their driving history and no matter that they call it vehicle insurance they're actually insuring the driver and the younger the driver and the more bad habits the driver has the more they'll pay in premiums because the idea is that they won't continue paying in the long term that's so they can take out loans essentially hypothecate on future revenue of vehicle drivers it is driver insurance when you send out a chartered ship to deliver supplies around the globe you do not insure the captain driving or piloting the ship. You insure the ship and the cargo on it. That's how you understand what they're actually doing. Medical insurance policies and life insurance policies, they're designed for the benefit of those doing the insuring and not the insured, so that those doing the insuring can then take out loans based off of the planned future revenue of the individual that is being insured. That's how hypothecation works. Now, of course, they can basically print their own money and extrapolate it, and they control the banking system. So if you do something they don't like, then they can leverage the whole financial mechanism against you. And for an individual, that can be quite scary. Now, you have to understand that most people, they worship the dollar, they worship currency, they worship digits inside of a bank account. Other things to them don't hold value, things like silver, gold, copper, even oil, those things, the only value they have is their quote-unquote market value, which is how much currency you can expend to obtain those things, the so-called buying power. Now, of course, when you're talking about this trade on individuals, that is essentially, in all accounts, what the modern definition and understanding and practice is of slavery, right? They enslave you, they benefit off your work, and you benefit uh, nothing from all your work. They get, they get and control everything, right? And of course, they do all this stuff so they can steal what they really want, which is the land and uh, commodities and essentially control, right? Enslavement. So what's interesting about the situation that the enemy, essentially, that operates these universities has put themselves into is that what they've done is they've tied their system of control 
to digital paperwork filing and the financial system itself. This idea of being able to print their own money, to be able to hypothecate and to control essentially bank the banking system with bank account numbers and things like that, and naturally paper filings as, as with the attendants at banks, they're nothing more than button jockeys, right? When they input something into a computer and it just comes out saying uh, they can't do anything about it, they can't do anything about it, right? That's all they do is they input information into documents online. Any computer program, of course, can do that. Now, because of this, they have exposed themselves to a major vulnerability. And this is not a if it will happen, but more like when it will happen. And I call it the pretzel attack. It's very easy to compromise this entirely global control system and to essentially destroy them with their own system, leverage it against them. And because they worship the dollar so much, they will fight to save their system even when it's beyond saving. Now, the specifics about how this pretzel attack will work can be found easily when you think about an attack on a home network. Vulnerabilities in many ways, which they designed to allow them to be able to exploit regular people's home network can be used against them. You can, for instance, access their banking systems through their networks, their Wi-Fi, their various networks. Now, if you use the computers in the bank, which have been had their addresses authenticated to the system, well, then you're talking about a much easier job there and also an inability to track down who exactly is the quote unquote culprit for such an attack as this because they will be the culprit and they will be the ones doing it. All you need to do is have a computer program which exponentially creates bank accounts. Using their own system that's already authenticated, it will just simply take over and run. And essentially speaking overnight, if you've got a well uh, written out program, an execute, .x execute file or whatever, which has in some way been embedded into the banking system well then what that will do is it will take the funds in one account and scatter it among say thousands of other little accounts and so in that way you basically tie the system up using its own mechanism you pretzel it it's like a pretzel uh, this is an idea, of course, that you could uh, attribute to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or grappling, in which you tie up your opponent, literally, by uh, using their own body against themselves. Or at least leveraging it, and knowing how the things work, and the fact that, say, your arm's not supposed to twist a certain way, and that's what you do to them. And, of course, it would be leveraging their own system, so they would be the ones doing it. Es es essentially, yeah. Um, so you release that program into their system and if you do it right they will burn themselves out trying to fix it instead of say just draining their accounts or just trying to attack their network and shut it down and all that stuff this is much more effective because when it's implemented they will believe they can save it and so they'll do everything they can and thus the more they try to save it the more accounts will be created the more subset accounts will create it, and the more funds will be distributed out like a constantly expanding pond. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can lock these accounts by having the computer program set a transfer and balance limit. And thus, essentially, you do possibly what would be even worse than just encrypting their data and then doing the ransomware thing. You would legitimately destroy entirely the financial network and it must be destroyed because in its current form it is being leveraged as a mechanism of warfare on humanity or against humanity and the ones really doing it today are the universities so ultimately we want to destroy the universities and their base of operations and taking down their financial structure and system is the way to do it and this is essentially speaking very easy it just hasn't been done yet it is only a matter of time 
because when it's done it'll be done and the people that would do it be would be the ones that recognize the fact that dollars and currency mean nothing they have these people who have set up these universities and these control structures have made it mean nothing they have false representation of tangible assets they are lying and they can do it because they run these so-called regulators which means that when they're taken down their phony system won't be able to come back because it takes a lot of effort and time to get away with such an expansive fraud and you can't just resurrect it, resurrect it from the ashes and they know this they've tied their whole mechanism to the central core aspect and it can be leveraged so easily against them they will do everything they can to save it and that will be their undoing now, as far as examples of these actual cell uh, groups of operations operating under cover identities, there is a group in Eugene, Oregon, a obvious group of people who are work appear to be anyway working together. Now, I personally in my own life have seen some of these groups and... I believe that the documents I'm looking at are real, but the names are fake and the backstories and identities are fake. The people doing it in actuality have backstories and false identities provided to them by the university structure. And in Eugene, Oregon, these individuals are all connected with the University of Oregon, which is not shocking. Now, in their backstories, the majority of them are told to have come from other places. None of them actually grown up there and they all tend to operate under the same types of cover and say the same types of things that we're all familiar with. But their overall objective is very obvious when you dig through the, the different uh, paperwork and you notice the patterns. So what they want is a resolution for human rights-based investment policies. Now this is not human rights as somebody would think of, of the privileges or, or the inherent natural rights of humans. No, this is, these are the human rights of the United Nations, a corporate document for universalist control out of the so-called universities. Now, some of these names here, as you'll notice, is Katie Preston, Rudy Preston, Sam Cook, and Kaylee Bronson Cook. Of course, you notice that their surnames are all the same. Well, that's also in addition to code, naturally, because then if you have individuals scattered out through different groups but they all have the same last name while well, you can you know who's your uh, comrade as it were now at one of these uh, resolution things from the city council the individual known as katie preston said this is our responsibility to take the power that we have financially and like i said this is in terms with the united nations so-called human rights list where that you can violate those and thus they will punish you for that obviously this is all fraudulent and it's treason but this is telling you of course that they are planning to wield the financial system against us as a weapon and we already see that happening with the land grab and things like that and they will also mention that as well now sam cook said he wants to direct the city manager and city attorney to revise our code now what exactly do they want to revise the code Four. Kaylee Bronson Cook says the time for action is now. It has been said by many supporting the boycott, divestment, and deportation. Of course, there's no actual context on what deportation is being talked about here. Now, Rudy Preston said you had three proclamations that started the meeting, a land back and or a land proclamation, all those things. Obviously, these people are all working together. They're coordinated, and some individuals who go to these city council meetings, they might be um, honest, but this is the same contact of embedding people into a crowd, and those people in the crowd are all coordinated, and they have talking points that they all speak together, creating the appearance that the crowd is going one way, and then other people in that crowd will pick up on it and start doing the same things that these people do. It's a classic tactic that's well known and then you have another individual ralph mcdonald who says china that's a uh, some apparent association for um, houses 
board supports the city council directing the city manager and city attorney to bring back to council consideration for enforceable code language for socially responsible investment policy. Sounds pretty Nazi, doesn't it? <clears throat> they also urge participated participation in the International Court of Justice. That's, of course, the same court that in a uh, executive order from Donald Trump <clears throat> era, anyway, the International Court was labeled as an enemy for their attempt to set up U.S. forces, um, U.S. armed forces personnel as scapegoats for cr crimes that have been directed by the United Nations and international coalitions in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, they go further with one desiring a blacklist for companies that commit, quote, uh, enable, commit or enable human rights violations. Now, again, those are the so-called UN human rights violations, essentially determining that they want what I've been talking about this entire time, which is a UN intervention occupation force, overt foreign rule, where they can do whatever they want, and they always do it under the cover of being the good guys, quote-unquote. Now, all of these people, uh, the university are connected with the University of Oregon, and Oregon, which you have to basically search the names and then dig through a whole bunch of crap and backstories and stuff to find out that they all are apparently faculty or in some way associated with the University of Oregon. And they're also organizers for something called, I believe, I might be misremembering, the Legion of Socialism and Liberation. That's not creepy. And all of them are self-proclaimed Palestinian Jews. That doesn't even make any sense. But they're attempting to cash in on the cover they create by saying they're equally Palestinian and also Jewish, so, you know, you can't mess with them or question what they're saying because they have a protected profile, protected class, right? Um, they are just name stealers. They just say they make up stuff. They're, they're liars, right? They are a enemy operation cell. This is exactly what it looks like, operating covert operations on U.S. soil, enemies of the people that live here the country, and the nation. Now, Kaylee Bronson Cook is also a connected child trafficker. In her uh, LinkedIn bio, she's uh, referenced as an enabler when it comes to so-called child abuse prevention and things like that, which is obviously covered for child trafficking. Also, one of her profiles contains the picture of a child, which is creepy. Now, the reason why that is important is because it's a pattern that is reflected uh, in Lancaster, Ohio, much farther away from Eugene, Oregon, but is a location of similar consequence in which you have these active enemy cells operating, co uh, conducting covert operations here in, our, in your own backyard, basically, right? It's like you have the guy who's in the KGB down the street, who's trying to destabilize the country. That's exactly what these people are, except they're doing it for the benefit of the United Nations. At least as far as that, the uh, patterns go and the evidence. Of course, they're doing it for the benefit of just international, global, criminal organizations to begin with. But uh, So my documentation of the operations in Lancaster, Ohio, starts with a local author fair at the Fairfield County District Library in Lancaster, Ohio. Now, the first element I would like to direct your attention to is Jane B. Knight. This is apparently the event organizer, and as you can see here, profile picture of a child. This individual I have met in person and is not a child. Uh, this here states is born in Lancaster, Ohio, graduated from Hawking College with a degree in health information management and works in healthcare. Not at all an individual that is representative of this profile picture. It's very interesting the connection between so called healthcare workers or uh, social workers and child trafficking. Now, there's other individuals that should be noticed here. First, is somebody who says that their author name is J.L. Ender. This individual uh, read part of their book, which was about somebody, a child, who was following around a, a superhero's um, 
you know, acting like, like the child had superheroes, basically. So it's very interesting. And the reason for that is because the same type of story was replicated in a local newspaper with particularly creepy implications. Now, here's the third member right here. Older guy named Michael Geary. Like I said, these are, they have backstories and false identities. Probably everything about them is false. Provided to them by local universities. Now, all of those people, when I attended a uh, writer meeting group thing, they sat, uh, well, there, were actually, there was actually a, a, another a young girl there. But either way, they all sat, uh, like if you had, a, you had square tables, right? This table's made square. They all sat across from each other. And all of them coordinated this plan to set up a so-called critique group. Now, the first reason for this is the idea that um, covert operatives have of getting somebody to do something and go along with it over time. Uh, behavioral modification, essentially. Now, obviously, you find people who are open to having their work censored, and then they're obviously they can do all the dirty work and then have their work stolen. But the other thing that it does is it establishes a, um, a habit of recognizing extrajudicial courts, which you see obviously universities popping up today where they all have formed these so-called student courts and faculty courts and things like that. They, all, they usually they use different names and whatnot, but that's basically what they are. They try people and hold them accountable for their phony uh, crimes and things like that. Now, the writing group, the way that they coordinated this was very obvious. And, of course, the tri child profile relates to the same, uh, to the Kaylee Bronson Cook out of Eugene, Oregon, also leveraging a child in their profile picture. Now, in the a particular newspaper, there were two things that stuck out. First of all, you had the front page article talking about the primary ingredient in Jane's pies being family, the uh, obvious implication of having... Uh, cannibalism people baked into uh, home goods being obvious there. Just like if people talk about, you know, meat at the grocery store having people in it, well, that's basically what this article is talking about, but in coded language, naturally. They're not going to come out and say something like that. Then you also had the Red Cross honoring Lipton restaurants, which is a little bit weird, right? Why would, uh, obviously, you know, you've got, of all the different places that could be highlighted, a restaurant chain is being highlighted by the Red Cross. And then to tie that all in, there's a article talking about two young girls who are superheroes who fight the Pumpkin King, which is a reference to a pumpkin festival in Circleville. And that's for Dr. Door. Now, the reason why this is important is because Dr. Door, in their overall symbology, they have a black cross, a white background, and then the outline makes like a red frame for a garage door. The first thing that would come to mind there is, of course, Monsters, Inc., the doors in Monsters, Inc., and essentially the implications with child trafficking. Um, you know, universities, you have subterranean structures, a lot of them. You also have strangely fortified rooms. Like, I remember when I was going to the Ohio State University, there was a copy room with a solid steel door, something you would see at, like, say, a prison or... Um, any sort of, or bank, you know, any type of secure location. It's very odd to have that there. And there's other things like that, but the perfect place, the perfect um, thing that the universities provide, especially with, like, say, the student union, is that you have a lot of traffic, a lot of foot traffic, and a lot of uh, young people passing through in there. They could do all kinds of stuff that would go unnoticed. Anybody who's older, they'll just, people assume as a member of the faculty, and anybody who's younger will just go unnoticed among all the other students that are there. And, uh, and there's a lot of traffic that goes through those places, so there's a lot of stuff that can happen. And when you're looking for those things, you start noticing places that are off-limits and restricted and, yeah, all kinds of interesting activity um, running under the cover that the university provides. Now, the symbol of a cross we are lied to about relating to execution. And the reason why that's important is because 
the only place that mentions that being used as execution, which apparently was so prolific, is the Bible and the fictionalized accounts from religion. However, in actuality, the cross is a symbol for crossroads, just like a tavern might have the symbol of a drinking glass, or maybe like a, a winery would have like a wine glass. Um, a smith might have a hammer. Right in the Middle Ages, they used signs depicting what they did rather than saying what they did. Now we try to use logos, but there's so many logos today that don't actually explain what the company does that you have to write it out and say what they do and all that stuff. Either way, the cross is that type, is the is a representative of that. It's the same thing as the compass rose, which has, or the cardinal points, which makes a cross, of course. You've got the medicine wheel for the four winds, which is the same thing, representation of the same thing, and the swastika is similarly a representation of a similar thing. What it's referencing is a crossing point. Just like when you cross a railroad, it shows the X across. Or X marks the spot, right? But what it's really representing is a point to cross. And the places that have those, just like Dr. Door, are referencing a point to cross into different areas, say subterranean structures where they traffic children, weapons, and other things. And these, of course, are enemy operations, so they would need things like that. So what their true purposes are say even trafficking bombs and things like that wouldn't go noticed by the general population because if the general population saw it they would obviously try to stop their own decimation and obviously you know all that other stuff so um now that we've got that covered let's talk about a little bit about some of the things that they've suppressed and the practical uh uh, technologies that they desire us not to have. So my first point as far as these new technologies is concerned is that humans in fact invented and developed the so-called flying saucer. Of course naturally we invented and developed many other types of technology but the flying saucer particularly captures a a sp space in most people's minds. Either they're avidly against its existence. You talk about flying saucers and they just want you to shut up and first they ridicule you and then they get angry and then, you know, all that stuff. You know how a brainwashed person acts. Now, the other people look at it and say, we can make tourists, we can make money off tourists. This stuff's interesting. They want to look into it, you know, things like that. Or they, they like watching movies or TV shows, right? The flying saucer design specifically uh, captures a, a place in people's minds. And, and the main reason for that is the flying saucer is a lot more technologically designed with the human perspective. What I mean by that is that most forms of transportation that we have is not geared towards how a human would design something to be elegant, to be perfect, in most cases to do mo many things, to be versatile. Flying saucer design can move aerodynamically in any direction, which a vehicle cannot, most vehicles anyway, a car, but a flying saucer would be a vehicle. Now there's uh, the interview on the Joe Rogan podcast in which a guy named Bob Lazar talks about some of the physics behind these flying saucer devices. Not the Nazi bell and not any of the other stuff, but particularly the levitating component of the flying saucer, in which he talks about a sphere, very heavy sphere, that's set over a pedestal, and then that makes the thing basically turn on and levitate and whatnot. Obviously, there's also the uh, uh, interview with uh, the recent interview with Trump that was aired, uh, at least he talked about the sphere that would move the so-called, uh, and then there's, you know, the Tic Tac and all those other things. But either way, the idea is, of the physics behind this, the pattern to how we came to make this technology can be found in a variety of different scattered works which have, in most cases, passed through the censorship but directly link or point the finger at 
the flying saucer being a human invention that was essentially stolen and kept from us while we're allowed only the crap and our enemies take whatever they want. Now the first piece of evidence for this is something called the New Attractive, containing a short discourse on the Magnus or Lodestone and among other, amongst other his virtues of a new discovered secret and subtle property concerning the declination of the needle touched therewith under the plane of the horizon. Now first found by Robert Norman, hydrographer, hereunto to be annexed, certain necessary rules for the art of navigation by the same RN. Newly corrected and amended by MWR, imprint, imprinted at London by E. Alds for Hugh Alley, 1596. Now, the Magnus Lodestone is not a magnet. It is something else entirely. And it would provide the understanding for exactly how this flying saucer thing works, which more than likely, I would say most, are automated what we might call drones. They're not actually conducted by humans. I believe that if we had a human vessel, one that would deliver a human vessel, uh, it would be much larger, say something the size of you know the USS Enterprise, which ironically is shaped with a dish on it. Now, the idea here is that you have a sphere in the middle, right? If you think about the shape of a sa saucer in the middle, there's an orb and a and then you would have something that rotates around that orb. And that would create something called the mass effect or the Magnus effect. Of course, mass effect is a video game that talks about the mass relays, which allow for intergalactic travel. But the effect itself is incorrectly thought of as magnetic force. It's an effect. It's the Magnus effect or gravity. These things are intentionally taught to us in an incorrect format. And that's easily understood when you read these documents. Now, I'll gloss over the poetry talking about it. Uh, the po poems in this are, are really good, actually. The first chapter of the Magnus Lodestone, where they are found, and of their colors, weight, and virtue, and drawing iron or steel, and of other properties of the same stone. So as it's saying, it's can, it can draw iron or steel. But as he'll clarify uh, later, is that the uh, density of the object, the weightiness of it, determines what, who's drawn to whom. Not necessarily the mass, right? Not necessarily the size. The Magnus, or lodestone, is found in diverse parts of the world, and most commonly in iron mines. And although it be ponderous and weighty, yet it is not found to be of the iron uh, I'm not actually sure what that word is it's a uh, yeah it's a uh, written in ye old language uh, neither containeth in it any metal of itself but hath a certain affinity unto iron or steel it was called mayones I don't know, that might be Magnus with the G off, otherwise it would be M-A-O-N-E-S. Because the first finder thereof was so named, who, as Pliny writeth, was an herdsman cast India. This stone, as with Cardinal Cusan, hath substance, virtue, and operation... His virtue is conferred and nourished of his substance. Of his virtue proceedeth diverse strange effects and operations, serving to many good purposes, as especially in the art of navigation, without which there could have been no discoveries by sea, nor the parts of the world made known frequented as now they are and therefore the virtue of this stone of all others may be accounted the most precious now of course this also relates to something called god kings and titans in which uh, a person explaining about ancient world travel talks about a particular stone used in navigation and 
how that related to Sargon of Akkad. Of these are diverse um, strengths differing each, well it says fort, but I believe that's the French strength, each from other as well in goodness as in color, weight, and force, but not in property. Although many have judged the variation of the needle to be according to the distance of the mine where the stone was um, drawn, or I am not actually sure what that word is, to the place where it is, where B, it, um, yeah, that word again. The first and best uh, strength of these Stones comes out of the cast India, from the coast of China and Bengala, and is of the color of iron or sanguine color. These stones are very massive and weighty, will be uh, drawn to lift up the weight of itself in iron and steel if the stone exceed not a pound weight. And these of, are of the finest uh, strength and sold commonly for their proper weight in silver in the cast India, where they grow, because the best and finest are very rare to be found, for it is commonly a soul stone lined by himself in the earth and no shell or piece of another. There is another sort of a reddish color found in Arabia, and the Red Sea growing broad and flat, much like to... Well, I'm actually not sure what that is. Lilith, Lilith stone? Something like that. Or slate. Lithe stone? This is not so weighty as those of China, but it is very near as good, and the virtue continueth long on the compass needle that is touched therewith. Now, of course, they also got the Calamita Preta, that is to say the Black Magnus, and this is, uh, there's also the Calamita Blanca, and uh, there these are in the Levant and on the Isle of Elba, interestingly, and a island called Porto Ferraro, and of course, who one has to wonder whether or not this uh, document it's allegedly from 1596 but considering the level and extent of um shall we say cleaning sanitization of documents uh, one has to wonder whether or not something anything uh if this thing actually escaped the sanitization of documents or the mentions of words being erased and things like that because these individuals that set up the university that conduct all these heinous acts and uh, operations of warfare, they do not obviously want us obtaining what humans invented, which is the technology that revolves around this particular stone. Um, there's, of course, stones in High Allemand, which would be Germany. Anyway, that's... Uh, Alema is the word used generally in French for Germany today, but one has to wonder how accurate that is. Norway, uh, in the mines, and also got Spain, Valentia, uh, Aliante, and Lisbonne. This would be Lisbon today, probably. Um, and there's a, a little bit, a little bit more on that. Uh, also mentions a philosopher, Arreros, uh, and uh, a few other things. So this stone hath the power to um, shew the attractive point, so hath the touched iron, as a stone hath some principal uh, points, so hath iron. And likewise, as the stone hath power to draw iron to it, so will the iron so touched draw another iron to it, and impart all these virtues to another iron in quality 
though not in quantity, and thus in all respects it containeth in it the very property of the stone. Now that sounds obviously also quite similar to telekinesis, or a book that talks about the ability to push upon metals. Now the most important thing here is where it talks about the ability to draw and to essentially be repelled that type of effect that they understood the virtue of the stone is distributive as many other virtues are much comparable unto musk that having a sweet savor and smell itself imparteth the same to another thing as to a pair of gloves and those gloves give out savor and perfume a whole chest of clothes uh, so uh, so the iron that hath received this virtue of the stone will extend and give the same to another and that iron to another and so to many isn't that interesting and and this point the stone is marvelous that notwithstanding you touch 10,000 iron uh, nails with him every one of them carrying away as much virtue as will lift by another his like so they exceed not the weight of a five penny nail yet the stone itself will be nothing diminished of this strength but continue of one source if i should lay say here that by the attractive strength of a small magnus of two or three pound weight i could lift up and cause to hang by virtue thereof a thousand pound of iron at one instant Per, uh, per adventure, you would be doubtful of the success. Nevertheless, by experience in all things wherein conceiveth truth and reason, of necessity reason must yield when truth is present. And therefore, because you shall not remain doubtful herein, thus you may do it and only make proof by two or three nails if you will for the same success that you have in them you shall have in all the rest now of course they used compass heads to find these stones but today we have a much more effective way to find these stones and that would be through the use of drones now it also says that the uh, stones growing on the bottom of the ocean can pull down a ship with iron on it and so that means that if you were going to go out and search for this magnus lodestone then the idea here would be that you would have a drone drone swarm autonomous that before it gets disrupted by these uh, various magnus stones it would essentially transmit its location to a similar drone and thus you would know where to find it rather than having to go around and use the compass which of course you could do but would take longer uh, and look at where the needle declines towards the stone that's something similar that's basically what this is sort of talking about it's talking about the how the stone can affect the declination of a needle in a compass and like I was saying before, uh, your compass will be attracted to a large deposit of it, say how mariners use the island of Elba for navigation. See, the compass would not just simply, quote unquote, point to magnetic north as we're always taught, but rather when you're traveling as a mariner and you're using this compass, it will point towards large deposits of Magnus stone. And it's very likely that the Bermuda Triangle has a large deposit of Magnus stone below it growing there now the next part that relates to the function the mass effect that powers a flying saucer can be found in an essay on magnetic attractions and on the laws of terrestrial and electromagnetism comprising a popular course of curious and interesting experiments on the latter subject and an easy easy experimental method of correcting local attraction of vessels on the compass in all parts of the world. Again, of course, this has to do with compasses. By Peter Barlow, Associate in the Society of Civil Engineers in the Royal Military Academy. Second edition, much enlarged and improved, illustrated with plates by Lowry, London, 18, 
23. Now in this section, in this uh, book, there is a section where it talks about the mass effect and how it relates to spheres, specifically. Such as uh, the orb that you, the very heavy orb that Bob Lazar talked about in powering such a vehicle, a vessel. Having made these deductions, I conceived an ideal sphere to be circumscribed about the ball of iron. And assuming the circle of no attraction is an equator and the poles of that circle as the poles of the sphere, I imagined circles of latitude and longitude to be described upon it and wished, if possible, to pass the compass around the ball in these several circles, keeping it always at the same distance from the center so that in taking the deviations, I might separate the effect due to position from that which might otherwise have arisen from a change in the distance. I determined also in order to disengage the effect due to the longitude from that which had reference to the latitude to pass the compass in the first place over circles of latitude only in circles perpendicular to the magnetic equator and finding after a few trials what I had indeed anticipated that the deviations were the greatest in that circle which passed from the poles through the east and west points of the equator, I made this my first or principal meridian and considered its longitude as zero. So essentially what this guy's talking about is that if you have a sphere, it doesn't matter where it's oriented, where it's up or down, it will always have the same poles, it will always have the same equator, it will always have the same um, pattern of uh, distance as far as um, latitude, longitude, all that stuff goes. So those things are accurate. Of course, when we understand the effect, which we don't today, most of us, that a Magnus stone would have on a iron, a lead, or steel sphere, well, then you're talking about a stable field that would be created from the uh, inherent effects that these materials have upon one another. And also when you understand the uh, what this guy's talking about as far as how spheres work and the shape of things, well, then you can create something that is not only aerodynamically superior, but superior in the uh, physics of travel itself. Now, he also goes on to say, my plan being thus laid and my table now divided in equal parts of five degrees and these again in certain places subdivided into less portions, I began by computing how much the center of the um, oh darn well uh, that was page 9 so now I'm going to go on to page 8 haha <laughs> a little bit out of order here being us thus assured that there are in every ball of iron two planes in which the compass may be anywhere positioned without being influenced in its direction. Now here he's talking about the uh, relation to a compass. The one that of no attraction as stated above and the other the vertical plane corresponding to the magnetic meridian my next object was to ascertain how far the angle of deviation of the needle was influenced and what law that deviation observed when the compass was removed out of those planes. But before I proceed to describe the experiments performed with a view to this determination, it may not be amiss to examine the deductions already made, which may be stated as follows. Eight, in the first place, it has been shown that every iron ball has what, from analogy to the case of terrestrial magnetism, may be for the present the denomination a magnetic equator lying in the plane of no attraction above mentioned. And of course, this does not apply to our current understanding of the so-called magnetic north. That, like Earth, also, it may be supposed to have two magnetic poles, the one directed towards the north and the other towards the south. So what, you have magnetic south and magnetic north? Well, then where does the needle point? If it is indeed attracted to a magnetic point, the line joining those poles being parallel to the natural magnetic direction of the dipping needle. It is possible that the poles it's themselves on this planet have immense deposits of the Magnus stone. 
These experiments likewise seem to indicate that the effect produced upon the needle by the iron, the distance being the same, depends on entirely upon the position of the center of the ball with reference to the pivot of the needle and not to its position with regard to either extremity. So yeah, basically what I just said. <laughs> now the third piece of evidence to understand how the physics, how they're describing the physics of the so-called flying saucer and what Bob Lazar talked about in the interview with Joe Rogan is electromagnetic or separation by C. Godfrey Gunther with illustrations 1909 Hill Publishing Company 505 Pearl Street, New York. So, of course, a lot, a lot of years, a lot of centuries, and a lot of effort of so many different people have been put into the invention of this, in some ways, perfect device, which we are not allowed to even see. The true, wonderful work of humanity, hidden away and kept to a few evil villains who want to decimate the human population, these so-called... Uh, reduce the population, the carbon footprint, all that nonsense, so that they are not threatened. Very despicable. Anyway, magnetism applied to ore dressing. All substances, solid, liquid, and gaseous, are either attracted or repelled by a magnet. Though in most cases, this influence is too feeble to be apparent, except with delicately adjusted apparatus. The atmosphere has a definite magnetic affectability, well, attractability, and the magnetic behavior of solids may be said to be controlled by the magnetic qualities of the surrounding medium. If a substance is more permeable to magnetism than air, it is attracted. If less permeable, it is repelled. The permeability of air, air being the most common medium, is taken as one, and the permeabilities of all other substances are referred to as unity. The permeabilities of substances more strongly attracted than air are therefore represented by values greater than 1 and are called paramagnetics. Substances less permeable than air are represented by values less than 1 and are called diamagnetics. The permeability of the diamagnetics is so nearly unity that the phenomenon of magnetic repulsion is not a familiar one. Of course, that's not a phenomenon. When you have something that in all cases is present, that's not a phenomenon. A phenomenon is something that happens randomly for no apparent reason. You can't explain it. It happens once and it's done, gone. If it re continues to happen repeatedly, it's not a phenomenon. It's simply something that is. Of course, they use the word phenomenon often today to uh, obfuscate these particular things about the idea of the mass effect, the Magnus effect, and how it relates to physics in general. How everything correlates to this idea, this concept, a stronger and better understanding of the natural environment, and how we can leverage it for our own benefit and gain power from that knowledge. The lines of force of a magnetic circuit pass along the path of least resistance. In other words, they pass through the most permeable substance available. Paramagnetic particles introduced into a magnetic field tend to align themselves in the direction of the lines of force in precisely the same manner that a compass needle aligns itself with the magnetic meridian. The paramagnetics concentrate the lines of force, while diamagnetics cause the lines of force to go around them. The passage of lines of force through particles induces magnetic polarity in them, and they gather in tufts or chains north pole to south pole, and are all held by the energizing magnet. The force with which these particles are attracted is a function of their permeability, the intensity of the field, and the time they are subjected to its influence. And that guy just described exactly how the so-called flying saucer functions. Thank you.